Andrew mentioned that I uh, used to work at Microsoft, and there was this beautiful moment that you probably only pick up on if you've ever worked at Microsoft, but just as Christina was having a problem with her video, Andrew stood up and went, it's probably not working because it's not a map. <laughs> and, um, such is life in Microsoft. <laughs> anyway, um, let's start with a few questions. So I'd just like you to raise your hand if, uh, just if you feel positively about these statements. So who thinks leadership's important to the success of organizations? Okay. Who's ever worked with a really good leader? Okay. And who thinks leadership and the way that leaders respond and focus on issues around safety and well-being is vital to the success of the programs that you might run out? Okay. And who might be having problems with leader engagement in their organisations? Okay. If you, you. Final question, who's woken up with a hot flush in the last week? <laughs> um, Okay, so what I'd like to do today is sort of demystify some of the themes around leadership. Um, leadership is almost inherently quite difficult. It's quite individualised, it's personalised, and it operates within very specific organisational contexts. Therefore, it becomes, for those of us who work in organisations, relatively difficult to manage, relatively difficult to interpret, and therefore relatively difficult to develop. However, the good news is, there are an increasing range of things that within organisations we're able to do to identify key areas of effective leadership and indeed develop more effective leaders to help our organisations be successful. What I'd like to do today is illustrate some of those themes and show you some research that at Aon Hewitt we've been conducting for a number of years that starts to illustrate the point. Now, inevitably, this research won't apply uniquely to your organisations and what you need to do. So for those of you who may be in broader HR roles, hopefully some of this will resonate. For those of you who may be more focused on, on the safety and wellbeing side, I'd really just like you to reflect as I go through, particularly the second half of my presentation, on the themes around effective leadership. Because I'll be pretty certain, having listened to Christina, that many of the themes I touch on would be equally applicable, just on focusing on different topics. So without that, let's get into it. So the first thing, quick word about Aon Hewitt. Aon Hewitt is a, is a global organisation. We do a range of things, but basically you can break down everything that we do into two pretty core areas. We work with organisations to help them mitigate risk. So in the part of the business that I work in, that's around people risk. So that is helping organisations better mitigate the risk of effective hiring. So key risk around hiring people, how do you know you're getting the right people who are going to be successful in your organisation, and how do you work through on that in terms of supporting them and their performance. Some of my colleagues, more focused on the health and wellbeing side, really starting to think about how you mitigate the risk of workers' compensation, some of the insurance premium that you might be facing, and some of the costs that you might be facing there. More importantly, really, we focus on the potential pits. So my world, we think about leadership, we think about high performance, we think about uh, really tapping into that innate and that intrinsic motivation that individuals have and aligning that to organisations to help them be successful. On the health and wellbeing side, we think about maximising the potential of people by proactively removing risk and enabling things like productivity through reductions of lost time frequency, injury rates, and those sorts of things. So, why do we think leadership's important? Mo pretty much anyone that you talk to in, in the business world, world, business world, whether that is corporate, worrying about profit, whether that's not for profits, worrying about the purpose that they exist for and being more effective in that area, most people will start to focus on some measure of business performance. It could be health and well-being outcomes at the same point. Most people, We'll also say, and most of you may take a leap of faith with me on this, that actually if we worked on the quality and effectiveness of our leaders, we have, we'd be able to have a direct impact on organisational performance. Pretty logical. Most people will buy into that. A few nodding heads over that side of the room. Okay, good. Um, so most people buy into this. The challenge that the vast majority of organisations face is we don't really understand what that connection is. And we can't measure it and we struggle to actively manage it. So I'd just like to illustrate through a couple of quick examples through some research today. How do you sort of lift the fog? 
How do you sort of help that dissipate a little bit? What are some of the things that you can do? And I think what's really interesting, we operate in pretty exciting times, I think, at the moment. There's this great convergence, mainly driven by technology, but the fields of technology and psychology are really converging at the moment, which I think in 10 years' time will have fundamentally changed the way that we think about some of these themes, the way that we think about work, and the way that we think about people issues at work. So I'd just like to illustrate a few things on that line too. So one of the things that we're potentially most well known for at Aon Hewitt is around engagement and engagement measurement. So another quick show of hands, sorry. Who measures employee engagement in their organisations? Okay, yeah, okay. Too many. Many organisations will do. Our model of engagement, we look at how satisfied employees are and how committed and willing to apply extra effort they are to help their organisations be successful. And we measure that looking at a range of things, not only understanding engagement, but also understanding some of the aspects of the work experience. So we might pick up on things like job security, work environment, safety, manager effectiveness, senior leadership. All of these things are going to have an impact on the extent to which individuals are satisfied with their work experience and committed to do more. Now what we find is, and we've researched this for many, many years, is that those organisations with higher levels of engagement achieve higher levels of organisational performance across a basket of measures. I've got a slide coming up with some pretty boring financials, to be honest, but they're just easier to measure. But what we increasingly know, for example, is that organisations with higher engagement have reduced safety instances. Where we see engagement going up, we see safety instances coming down. We see return to work rates increasing as engagement goes up. So engagement increasingly becomes a bit of a proxy for employee satisfaction and productivity. So increasingly now, and here's where the technology comes in, people have been measuring engagement for about 20, 25 years. It's not a new model. Technology, though, enables us to gather information far more specifically, to segment information far more accurately. And what it also enables us to do is look at those drivers of engagement in far more detail more on that in a moment. Here's just a quick slide. Uh, this is some global data from our ongoing research. It sort of proves the point. Um, uses the phrase um, of total shareholder return and, and a few um, key performance metrics. The reason why we use these is relatively easy to get this out of company reports and that sort of thing, so it's publicly available information. But really what you can see is those organisations with lower quartile engagement underperforming compared to their market. And what we typically see is certainly enlisted organisations where we have access to this information. Organisations which on the Aon Hewitt measure have less than 40% engagement. So 40% of less than 40% of their people actively saying good things about their organisation, reporting a positive in intent to remain with their organisation and actively applying discretionary effort to help that organisation succeed, they will typically underperform their market by a various range. Upper quartile organisations, so here in Australia these are organisations who are at this point in time engaging around about 65%, so two thirds of their people. They're going to outperform the market by various ways. And then we have this group of organisations that we call the best employers. And we don't necessarily calculate it this way, but broadly think of them as the top 10% of organisations and they will overachieve on these metrics again. When we look at things like their safety data, the same is absolutely true. I can tell you that some of the organisations in the Australian Best Employers Group don't actively track sickness, absence, health and safety information because they simply don't need to. The effort involved in the tracking simply doesn't pay dividends. It simply such low levels that they continue to work on those aspects that drive the outcome rather than the activity. So we don't often get the chance to celebrate the good things. In corporate life we tend to find things to complain about, we tend to find things that we can be critical of. But I think you know, we, we announced 2014 Best Employers last week, um, so a great group of organisations. I'd just like you to have a look at the list. I think the thing that always impresses us about the list. It's not who they are, it's not whether or not you've actually heard of them or not, but the sheer diversity of organisations that are there. So engagement and that high level of productivity and all of the benefits that it accrues 
isn't determined by which sector of the organisation it's in, it isn't determined by the organisation size, it isn't determined by whether or not the organisation has a big brand name behind it. It's influenced very much by what takes place within the organisation. And the biggest influence on that will be the leaders in that organisation. So, some great organisations, if in the course of the work you have the opportunity to connect into any of these guys, I would so strongly recommend it. They do such incredible things with their people, and they face all of the same business challenges that any other organisation does in this country at the moment. They're not immune from that, and yet the way that they choose to respond to those challenges very often is quite unique. So, you have the opportunity to do check in and talk to these guys. They all have amazing stories around the work that they've been able to do with their people. I mentioned earlier that we have this sort of convergence, this confluence of, of technology and psychology at the moment, and increasingly what we're able to do um, through that combination is segment certain aspects of the workforce through things like engagement surveys, but also increasingly use psychometric measurements to understand what are some of the characteristics and behaviours of leaders that result in outstanding business performance. So what we've been doing on a global level is combining the huge number of psychometric assessments that we do every year with organisations that we also measure engagement on and saying, well, which leaders actually create high engagement? And by virtue of us using psychometric measurements, we can start to understand what are the characteristics, what are the behaviours, what are the outcomes that these leaders generate that makes them really good. Core challenge, what is a good leader, is going to be different in each of your organisations. So, inevitably this is the point where the research is immediately incorrect. But it does give us some generic themes. And it's interesting to view this, I think, through that sense of well-being, particularly psychological well-being. Particularly again, as you start to think about some of those challenges of work pressure, job security, so on and so forth. Pretty simply though, you know, these, some of the themes here aren't unique. Um, finding purpose and connecting people to the work that they do. Key aspect of resilience. Stepping up, so leaders stepping up in the face of challenging situations and connecting to their people. So it's that sense of being upfront, being resilient and providing that sense of stability and energy to people in challenging situations that in turn will build their own resilience. You know, there are many theories about leadership. You know, many of you who, who might have studied this, you'd have heard of authentic leadership. You'd have heard of um, servant leadership. Great themes, all valid. What we're finding, though, is it's a combination of these things that really starts to make the difference in these engaging leaders. Key point being, how they go about this will be unique to themselves. But it's the behaviours that are perceived by their followers and of course, the old adage that you know, leaders have one key requirement, and that's usually followers, is that as perceived by their followers, these are the characteristics they demonstrate. So here's the really interesting thing. If you could understand who in your organisation as a leader displayed these things, or who you might hire into your organisation that would display these things, would that be an advantage? The great news is you could do that today. Very, very simply, very scientifically. So when we think about this sense of the world of work and the way that we think about work and how technology is going to change it, it is exactly this sort of impact. Increasingly, recruitment will become far more accurate and that will be demonstrated through increasingly accurate outcomes. I want to show you this chart. We, um, we did some work recently, this is in Australia, and we started to look, we asked a series of questions through an engagement survey around how managers created a safe working environment. So not necessarily leaders at the top of the organisation, but managers running work teams. Increasingly where individuals reported that their manager responded to safety instances more proactively, where they believed that if they raised a concern, their manager would act on it, the number of safety instances came down. And partly that is self-prophetic, but immediately we can start to see that identifying the right managers, providing them with the right support, has a direct impact on some of the outcomes that we'd be most looking to create. Again, 
this sort of analysis, this sort of data, works really well in influencing leaders to do something different within their organisation. What we're absolutely able to do is attribute dollar values to this sort of thing. If you start to think about the cost of one of these instances, the impact of that on workers' compensation or other insurance premia, you can very quickly start to build a business case. You can actually do this in terms of your mass recruitment as well. We did this recently with a, a railway company in North America, and we actually reduced the percentage of their first year people making claims on the equivalent of their workers' compensation premium by 14.5% previously before we started to do the work to some quick pre-hire testing. Um, started the, roughly that 15% of people in their first year would make a claim for a safety-related incident. Within a year, that had fallen to under five. So again, we can start to increase the accuracy to find people who are going to be best suited to the safety environment you want to create. So there's some interesting stuff. These engaging leaders, however, very quickly, you can't necessarily teach them, but they do learn. So the critical thing that generates these really engaging leaders is their own experience. It's not when they've been on a Mount Eliza course or any one of my sessions or anything like that. It's the experience that they generate and what they learn from it. They are also likely to be driven by some guiding principles that will give them that sense of uh, egalitarianism to connect well to their people, that sense of caring, that sense of stability and support, and they will consistently demonstrate these behaviours. So again, key message being, Leadership doesn't have to be ambiguous. You can actually break it down, and you can measure it, and you can understand ways in which to create it. Now, that's all well and good at the individual level. Um, what about the organisational level? Um, again, there's some good news. So we also run a pretty big survey globally every three years or so uh, called the Top Companies for Leaders Survey. And this basically enables us to understand who are the organisations that are leading the way in the development of leaders. So it's one thing to know them when you've got them, it's one thing to be able to identify them. How do you grow them? We're just in the midst of our 2014 survey. 2011, a few local organisations in Australia and New Zealand, so Coca-Cola, Amatil, CBA and New Zealand Refining, that made our list. But these are organisations who consistently lead the way in generating the leadership talent that they need and in terms of supporting that. And I think in the interest of time, this will probably be my last slide, but here's the point that I'd like you to think about if you're responsible for safety and well-being. The messages I'm going to give you on this slide, what's about leadership and leadership development, apply absolutely equally to the creation of more resilient, safer workplaces through leadership. So the first thing, leaders lead the way. In terms of leadership development, um, really the key point here is that this is not leaders providing the rhetoric around the importance of developing leaders. This is leaders actively demonstrating through their behaviour that the development of future talent is absolutely visible and, and important. So you would find if you have a corporate leadership development program that, that in these organisations that probably isn't run by the HR function. That will be run by the senior leadership team. So my colleague Ajmal and I periodically get, get various development programs. I can tell you 18 months ago I was on a program, role play based development, lots of discovery. I walked into my first role play and the head of our Asia Pacific practice was pretending to be the client. Pretty scary, but he committed a week of his time to get involved in that program. It doesn't more than once a year. It's that sort of commitment that we're looking for here. It's not just the rhetoric of this is important, but the overt involvement. Similarly, for those of you in listed organisations or private organisations with boards, the board of directors will get actively involved, either in those more programmatic ways or indeed in terms of mentoring. And that will be an expectation of success of those leaders within the organisations. Um, I might just drop down, we'll go counterclockwise on this. Intense focus on talent permeates every level of the organisation. Most organisations will do some form of succession planning in the top companies for leaders. Basically, they will start assessing for talent earlier in career, they will go deeper, and they will go broader. So they won't just look at the top few levels and think about leadership team succession planning. They'll be thinking about critical skills development. They'll be thinking about what does the organisation need to be most successful, how do we develop people with those skills. Again, simply translate that back. 
what are the skills, what are the attributes that are most important in creating the safety culture that we need, how do we manifest that, how do we promote those people, how do we identify them through the organisation. And that goes right the way through the organisation. For example, you're unlikely to be promoted to a more senior management position in these organisations if you're not a role model for some of those leadership development behaviours. Absolutely no reason why you couldn't do that around safety and wellbeing as well. Um, leadership strategy reflects the overall business strategy. If you're not doing it for that, it's kind of pointless. Um, but the reality is if you're not aligning the skills you need with the outcomes that you want, frankly it's a bit of a wasted effort. These organisations will do that continually as their strategy changes, as their business world changes, they'll update their programmes. They'll update the skills, they'll update the outcomes, and they'll review the people that they've identified as top talent. And the final thing is simply this institutionalisation. It is one thing to have a whole bunch of programmes. Pretty easy to generate programmes. But if they don't integrate, if they're not lived, if they're not executed on really well, and if they don't align to the other programs and practices that you have, simply you won't get the traction. So a key message, it doesn't necessarily matter how much money you have, how much resourcing you're able to apply to this, but if you focus diligently on effective execution, you're going to get an awful long way. So, I'm just going to bounce through a few slides here because I'm going to talk about those. I'll wrap it up. If any of the research has interested you, if you'd like some more detail, if you want to grab myself or Rajmal after the, this, We'll be out there for morning tea, and also there's my email address, so please do feel free to get in touch. Thank you.